uh, mobile microphone won't work with me, so forgive me, I'll be rather standing here than there. But there is no, no much room to wander, so anyway. Um, yeah, it's a good time just before the lunch. I hope you won't, won't skip it at the end to, to just grab something to it. There will be plenty left, I can assure you. And my name is Barbara Fushinska. I'll be talking to you about big data in Azure ML uh, with my poetically phrased title, Streams, Lakes, and Oceans. So basically, it, it is a talk about big data. Who am I to talk to you about big data in Azure ML? I was a programmer for 12 years before I joined Microsoft quite recently, a couple of months ago, and now I'm a data solution architect. My background is in machine learning. My master's degree was in machine learning. I was trying to produce a new type of a classifier. And I was always a math enthusiast, uh, enthusiast so uh, this job is perfect for me. So what do we do is we try to uh, help companies move their workflow to the cloud Azure, obviously, because of Microsoft. And my particular job is to help them moving their workflow connected with data, all the data services, analytics, machine learning, etc. This is what we will be talking today about. So part of the big data, we'll talk about what, what I meant by ocean streams and lakes, a little bit about machine learning itself and how it actually connects to big data and how they are not the same thing. And of course, how you can do big data on Azure platform. We'll jump straight into the specific use case because it won't be just a theory, it will be use case driven presentation. And I chose for you, especially for you, aircraft predictive maintenance. I will go through the machine learning model, we will go through the whole architecture, how can you make predictions and how can you visualize it, where you will discover my stunning design skills with building, with building dashboards. So this is our use case, aerospace predictive maintenance. It is a big data project. If you imagine that you're in charge of an aircraft and you need to make sure your airplanes are working correctly. When I was flying here to Sydney, we had like half an hour delay. I was flying in from Seattle and they said, well, we have, we have some leakage. And you're thinking, yeah, well, that's, that's not good. We'll, we will um, get, get a maintenance team and, and they, will, they will investigate what happened. And I was thinking, yeah, I'm going there with the presentation. What if you could foresee it? What if you could like, predict when there will be a leakage or any kind of a, uh, a, bark, uh, a break of it? So I chose the example for you that deals with engines. So the problem is actually not just about you know, passage, passengers not feeling comfortable just before the flight. It's about reducing cost. If you can predict when your machines are likely to, to break, you can um, have a plan, you have a roadmap of maintenance work, and you can save a lot of money. This is a big data project. So what, what actually big data is? A massive buzzword, of course. Everyone is using big data for everything connected with data. So I heard big data is the same as data science. Big data is the same as machine learning. Machine learning is big data. No, it's all connected or it can be connected, but it's not the same thing. If you, if you want to think about data science as such, I think this is the, the broadest umbrella that underneath has all of the stuff that you can hear under any buzzword you can, you can think connected with data. That's why it's called data science. But big data, this is smaller umbrella that you can think of any stuff that, that cannot be done, that are broken with traditional relations, relational approach. It doesn't mean that when you have a relational database, you cannot have big data. Of course you can, and I actually think relational databases are the 
the structures or the, uh, the knowledge that we have and really, really understand. So big data doesn't mean no SQL. Big data doesn't mean uh, very often just the volume, doesn't mean you need to have a lot of data. It can mean variety of data. We have different data at the moment. We have sensors, we have, uh, uh, we have IoT, we have social media. So this is also big data. Doesn't mean that it needs to be a lot of them. I get questions all the time about the volume of big data. So people are asking, what, what's, what's the size, right? What's the size of big data? Because with today's computers, we can just put stuff into our memory and just do calculations there. Why, why do I need all those fancy technologies? So my advice is, if you can do it, do it. Do it in memory. Do it in your console if, if you have like grab stuff and you can search through it. You don't need all those stuff if you can do it on your laptop. For you, it's not a big data. But it can be even with the same size of the volume for someone else with different circumstances. So why is the traditional approach a little bit broken? Why, why it doesn't fit anymore? This is a very nice slide. I think it's a very nice slide from uh, Martin Fowler's web page. He has a gift of explaining some concepts very, very clearly. When we think of data warehouses, usually how you work with them is you prepare data beforehand and then you fit your warehouse with them. You clean them, you structure them, you arrange them in a certain way. So you do aggregations, you do joins. And then data warehouse is serving those data in a nice, usually SQL kind of a form to people that want to get information. So you have a lot of preparations beforehand. And data lake, it's something that has, that is serving, serving different purpose. The purpose is we have so many data and we don't want to spend all this time preparing them. Why? Because for example, we might not need all of those data, but we always think we will, so we'll keep them just in case. And then you can keep them, you can store them in different forms, structures, unstructured, unstructured, unstructured uh, blobs, files, media, however you want. And then if systems want to do something with them, they can search through them, they can do different stuff and use different technologies to deal with them. In my title, there are also oceans. What is a data ocean? If you think like data science wise, there is no clear concept yet at least, I think about what data ocean is. But if you think of a data lake, it's, it's something people can just jump in and pick up the data from different forms, from different uh, sources. Oceans would be something more global. Data lake is, is, uh, is a structure that you build for your company, that you build for your organization. Data ocean for me would be a concept that is more worldwide. And if you think of it, the internet is a data ocean. All the APIs that are there, all the data that you can just jump in and take, and you can drown in it, as this cute little guy is doing. You can think of the waves of data. Uh, you can think of any analogy uh, that, that is connected with, with the flow and, and with oceans, but also, you cannot think of data ocean as a big database because big database is static, is something that you take as a whole. When you do select, you select for everything. Of course, you have indexes and you can, uh, you can optimize it, but it's a different way of approaching data. If you think of the ocean, you take just one area and you try to swim there. You don't swim through the whole ocean. But if you need the data from the other side, you probably need to plan it and, and take your journey there to do it. But it's not, not a small piece of data. For machine learning and big data, for me, 
much more important is the second aspect of big data, which is velocity. And when we think about velocity, we need to understand how data are served. So when we go back to uh, streams, oceans, and lakes, you usually think of streams that, that go to the river, river goes to the sea. And this is a great analogy, but sometimes you have a data lake and you can create streams from the lake, you can create streams from the ocean, from the sea. This, this is where analogy is broken, but not where big data is broken. So you can do any kind of speed, any kind of velocity, any kind of direction where your data are served, ingested, passed through, analyzed, changed. So let's talk about BI and analytics when we think of big data. When you think only about volume and you try to build a dashboard, you usually end up with something like data warehouse. So you have some data, you store them somewhere, and you present a report. This is what our, I don't know, revenue for the last quarter was, right? So it doesn't matter if you have like really, really fresh data because standard, classic, BI and analytics are just reading the data and trying to understand what happened in the past. When you're thinking more real time, then you could do stuff like you know F5 and refreshing, or you can think about something smarter, about web sockets, about polling, something that is changing in front of your eyes. So even though it's still BI, even though it's still analytic, it's still dashboards, it's still just visualization of data, you can approach the problem different way. And the, velo the velocity is, is a key thing here because depends on what, what are your needs, you need to take, care, uh, you need to take into consideration how, how the data will change to the person that is looking at them. So we have streams. Streams are very interesting, uh, very not understood type of velocity. So you can imagine on the left side of this diagram, you have like sensors, IoT devices. We have small computers. I have two in my purse, right? That are sending data somewhere. And something needs to be done to ingest it. And it's not an easy thing because it's really hard to predict the pace of those data, the type of those data, and something, people are building stuff like this that can ingest anything, right? So you have event hubs, we have stuff like Kafka, um, simple queues, simple like message buses that can take those signals, can take those data and do something with it. So what can we do? The easiest thing we can do after we ingest the data is to just present it. Like kind of play like a, like a data lake, but it's not data lake because all those data will disappear after some time because that's how usually this part is built. Something needs to read it. Very often this is implemented as pops up kind of architecture. So the data is served if you want it, register and, and get the data. And then if we want to do some analyt analytics, we need to have another piece in this diagram that is ingesting it. Kafka is doing it. So uh, stream analytics on Azure are, is doing it. It's not an easy thing because you, again, you don't have a piece of data that you can go and select stuff and aggregate. You have stream, so you have a time frame to work on. And this is why Apache Hadoop was built to work with huge data volumes and it works in a, in a way of uh, divide and conquer it can deal with any data vari variety uh, because there are different ways how to, how to, for example, query the data. They can be structures or unstructured. And of course, stuff like Spark, like Storm, 
that, that can deal with, with the flow of the data, or of constant flow. The talk is about machine learning, and I keep getting the, the misunderstanding. Machine learning and big data are the same thing. They are actually completely different. And if you work with machine learning, you probably know this. But if you don't, you might get this misconception. So actually, when you think of machine learning, how it works, and you look at this diagram, we have some algorithm and we have some training data. The algorithm is trained, and once we decide, OK, my algorithm is good, we publish it. And then when it's published, we can use it to do stuff in our system. But this side of, of training, of learning the, the model, is done beforehand, behind the scenes. And it's not really usually plugged in in our system. This is what is plugged in in our system. We have published model, and we can ask for the opinion of our model. In case of our predictive maintenance, for example, when will mach my machine break? So where is the big data part in this? So data part is here and data part is here. Here we have training data. And believe me, they usually are not big data because learning an algorithm is a time-consuming job. And if you have bigger data set, of course you can think your model will be more accurate. But if you, if you do it smart, you don't, don't need to have a big data set. Actually, if you think of Azure machine learning, uh, studio, they can only allow you to ingest 10 gigs of data. It's hardly a big data, right? So this is not the part when you, when you think of a big data, but this can be. When you have your published model and you plugged it in your system and you have incoming stuff in case of predictive maintenance, we can have our sensors read, reads, we can query, we can ask for the opinion of our published model. Or we could do it even smarter. We could gather the batches, little batches of our sensors and ask for the opinion calling, on, uh, calling our published model only once, right? But th this is like an architectural choice. But, uh, but in this case, which usually come to mind, no big data, unless you do something called online learning. So your training stream is coming in and constantly updating your model. Unfortunately, you cannot do it in Azure ML, at least yet. In Azure ML, you have this offline learning, you have the training model and, and the classic way of doing it. So when you're thinking of big data and Azure, and all of the stuff I just told you, this is like a classic, uh, classic uh, slide that uh, we people at Microsoft can, can have it, but it's also on every page. This is all the technologies and all the approaches almost that you can think of when you're thinking of a big data. Lately, there is something called IoT Hub. So in, instead of even Hub, and uh, if you want more management with your IoT devices, you can also use IoT Hub. So you have Data Factory, Data Catalog, even Hub. Those are uh, the technologies that you can use to move your data to some place that, that you can do something useful with them. And you can see you have Data Warehouse and you have Data Lake because both of those approaches are not exclusive. You can actually use your data lake and uh, do some stuff like cleansing the data and fit them into your data warehouse. Because data warehouse, it's not something bad because it's a classic approach. It's just something that cannot deal with many problems that we have today, but can deal with many problems that, that we are used to having. But the most interesting stuff are happening here. So we have machine learning, we have data lake analytics, which are using approach like Lambda, you only call a function and you only pay for the analytics you're running. Once it's done, you're not paying. 
We have HD Insight, which is uh, Hortonworks distribution of, of Hadoop, and Stream Analytics. This is the thing that uh, Cognitive Services, Bot Framework, and Cortana. Who has ever used Cortana? Yeah, so this all is called Cortana Intelligence Suite. But Cortana is just one, one of the pieces here. Because of the Cortana Intelligence, you have all of those stuff together. There would be a different pricing model if you make a deal with Microsoft. That's one thing. Another thing, it's just very easily pluggable together. If you take those pieces, we make it uh, easy for you to connect the, the dots. But the, for me, the most important thing is that there are so many ready-to-use solutions. And I will show that to you in a second. So let's talk about our problem description. We have sensors that are, um, that are uh, readings from our engines, and we want to have something useful from them. We can ask a question, where well, will this machine break? If we know, we can plan in advance, right? Or we can ask different questions, because this would be a regression question. You, know, you get like months or days or weeks, so you can plan. Different question would be, will my device fail in two weeks? Because every two weeks I could run this algorithm, or every week or every day even, and I can plan in advance where to send the maintenance people. Or there is, um, I had a hard time with understanding this uh, third question, which is like, will it fail in two weeks, uh, or will it fail in be between two and four weeks, or will it not fail in four weeks? But what I found out, this is a very valid question when you're planning maintenance. So you have those, it doesn't have to be two weeks or four weeks. You can, you can put any unit, of course, there. Uh, but this is something when people are planning the maintenance job, maintenance work, uh, are actually thinking in categories like this. With our example, we have 21 sensors reads and stuff like uh, three settings, which are the settings of the device. So we need to know how the device is, is started with. And there is something called cycle, because machine is, engine is sending the signals for, for a cycle, per cycle. And the cycle can be a one day, one minute, one second, one millisecond, whatever you want. So if you, uh, if you think of this as a specific example, it is, because it's a real aircraft sensors architecture that, that I will show you. But if you're planning to do something similar, for any device, this is a very abstract way of, of putting a problem. You might, ha you might have just five reads, and your devices could be all the same, so you don't even need those settings. But if you think of a cycle, you can adjust your system to your needs. So how does machine learning work in this case? Someone created a testing data, and how did they do it? They've noticed that machine is going fine and then breaks in some, at some point, right? And then it's broken. So an example here, it's broken in 135th cycle. And someone said, well, that's probably not just connected with the current reading, the last one, or, or the one before. It's somehow connected with the history of those sensors reads, right? So um, they probably try to, to draw something like this. But if you think of like milliseconds, the, the device is sending the, the sensors and of dimensions when we have 21 sensors, it's not something a human being can analyze. Unless you're genius, and I appreciate that, but most of us can't. Um, so the idea was, how do we capture the past? Or like the near past before the machine breaks. And the idea is, we get the sensors read, and we get the average of those sensors read from, I don't know, five last cycles, two last minutes, two days, whatever it is, and standard deviation. 
So average is you take the reads and you divide it by the number of reads. Standard deviation, if you don't know, it's something that tells you how the reads differ from the average. So let's see it in machine learning studio. How, how do we actually decide? Remember our question is, will the machine break in two weeks? This is what I, why I love Cortana, not for the, uh, of course, for the technology, and those are very cool stuff, but most of the job you Google in Cortana, uh -huh, right, uh, Bing it in Cortana, uh, <laughs> and you find the answer, you find the solution. Sometimes not just, this is actually uh, uh, just a machine learning piece, but sometimes when you Google it, sorry, uh, search for it, you have the whole solution, the whole architecture. You click deploy and you have the whole infrastructure. This is amazing and sounds brilliant, but be careful because it's, it sounds easy, it is easy, it will deploy, it will create all of those stuff. But if you really want to plug it in for your own problems, you really need to understand your problem. You really need to understand how those people did this. So it's like an open source community, but not always you can find all the documentation, for example. Because this is what people are sharing and what they decide they are sharing. And sometimes they are so deep dive into, into what they're doing, they might not share all the details. But it is a community. You can reach to them. You can ask them. There are comments below. So, so that's my favorite part when it comes to Cortana. Just pick and choose. So I did. Because any solution I would figure out wouldn't be as good as what those people actually did. What are the data sources when you think of Azure ML? There are plenty of them. You can, you can get SQL, you can get Blob, you can run Hive query from Hadoop. Unfortunately, you cannot use DocumentDB, which is a shame because DocumentDB size is like 10 gigs and you can only ingest 10 gigs to Azure ML. It would be brilliant, but not yet. I think they are working on it, but I'm not sure. It, it would make sense, but, but it's not yet there. With Azure ML, once you create your machine learning uh, model, you can publish it as a REST API. Or maybe after seeing Dylan's talk yesterday, I should say you can publish it as an API. So you have an API and you can ingest it and you can use it in any system you want. You don't even have to use Azure anymore. You can just use any technology because it's just HTTP, right? So this is my uh, architecture that I will present to you. We have sensors. I will read them in Event Hub. I will pass them through Stream Analytics, and Stream Analytics will call uh, machine learning. The algorithm uh, I will just I will just show you in in a second. It will call the algorithm, which was previously uh, I will show you that in a second, which was previously trained. But Stream Analytics has another job. Remember those uh, average stuff and standard deviation? Stream Analytics needs to actually figure out those, this history and, and calculate it and put it through the machine learning. Then it goes to DocumentDB, and I built a stunning, beautiful pink app uh, that will show you how those uh, sensors events are read and if they need maintenance or not. Another thing is uh, when we trained our model, we can force the model to be retrained. And there is a way in Azure ML to just do it behind the scenes. Once it retrained, you can plug, you don't have to do it. It plugs it in the new version and, and you have a new, newly learned model. Okay, maybe I'll just go through the browser. Let's go here. Do you have, we have, can you see it? Yeah. Um, I really love machine learning, but the only way you can uh, talk to it and you can show stuff is through the web browser, at least at the moment. And you can see that if you have a, 
don't worry about what's what's there. You re I really encourage you to go online and look for for the details. We won't go into details. It would be too too long for for this for this talk. But I just went went to the Cortana page. I clicked it. I copied it in my own workspace, and now I can use it. It's that simple. If you want to understand it, you have everything there. The thing is, they use uh, different classification problems. And also, benefit of the cloud. You can just use different algorithms and check which one is the best. And if one proof, proves to be the best, then you say, oh, there you go, publish this one. So this is the, uh, I would say, standard machine learning uh, experiment. And if you go to like tutorials and how to do it, you can build very simple ones. But real word algorithms look more, more like this. They don't fit usually in one, in one page. I rearranged it to fit in one page because I wanted to take a screenshot in case the, the Wi-Fi doesn't work properly. But uh, to understand it better, you, you really have a complicated thing here. And believing that it will be easy to understand is a little bit naive, but it is easy to get a ready-to-use solution like this. Once you have this, you can publish it as a web service. And the funny thing, on that web page on Cortana, you can actually download this bit, only this bit. You have a trained model and you have a published web, web service. You just need to run, you need to click here, deploy web service, and it's there, running. You don't even go through this machine learning part with those four different classification models because they all did, did it for you together. I encourage you to do it again because it's good to understand the problem when you're trying to put it in production system, of course, but if you just wanna play, if you just wanna understand how other people are doing it, or just want to use something that it is proven, for example, you want to put a sentiment analysis on Twitter, you really don't care that much how, how it's done. Just take it how it is. So we have a web service and we have some URI and of course some access key that we'll be using later. So going back to my, uh, maybe I will show you back the solution architecture. Uh, this is just the bit of machine learning. Let's look at event hub. How, how is it done? So to create an event hub, you still need to go to the, not the, the last one portal, if you know what I mean, if you are dealing with, with the newest portal. So this is the new portal, and this is the new, new portal. Service bus and event hubs were, are still not moved to the new, new portal. You can see them as resources, but barely, you can barely do anything with them. So if you go here, you, uh, you see your service bus, and if you go to your event hub, I was trying to, to fit the system with some data, you can see the statistics, right? So, so you can see how your system is behaving. Because I'm, I'm talking for, yeah, half an hour now, or even longer. For half an hour, there were no data. I wasn't sending any data. And this is this easy. The only thing you need to configure when you're creating event hub, let's see, it's the message retention, so how long the message ingested message will stay in the queue, and the partitions data. This is very interesting if you're, uh, if you're into stuff like this. For me, it's brilliant. You just send stuff, and Event Hub is figuring out where to put it, to deal with it, and for later for the readers to get the data in a quick form so that everything doesn't broke, right? It doesn't break. It's like message queue bus, but better because it uses partitioning and, and it's all done for you. It's just brilliant. You need to uh, create something called uh, as a uh, shared access policy, uh, policies and you need, of course, uh, to have an, an, an access key so that then you can plug uh, the output of your event hub somewhere else. And, of course, if you want to send the data to your event hub, you need to know how to access this. The thing that um, people usually forget, and that's why uh, there is a default for it, are consumer groups. If you have different apps 
different clients reading from your event hub, you should create different consumer groups. But if you just want to test, if you just want to see how it's working, there is no need, you can just use the default. But the default will be crowded if, if you plug it in in a production system. So the next thing, after we, uh, after we uh, read our, uh, our events from the sensors, is how to, uh, maybe, maybe we'll go to the end, because stream analytics is the most important, but we need to know how to put it at the end. So document DB, I chose it, but I warn you, if you have big data in terms of volume and you want to store them somewhere, document DB is not big data. Document DB is big data in terms of unstructured data. This is this part of big data of one of four Vs, but it's not a database meant to be uh, or any document database. I'm not talking about this one uh, in particular. I'm talking about anything, like MongoDB, CouchDB, anything. It's a database where you don't care that much if you lose some data, which could be the case here. We might not care if some sensor data are lost, but just you need to decide if that's the case. And you need to realize that it only <laughs> takes like gigabytes of data, right? In terms of volume, it's not a big data database. So I just created uh, one collection, and if I go to the collection, I have one document. If you speak in terms of NoSQL, you probably know what I mean. If you don't, if you're still a relational uh, person, this is like a database, and this is like a table which in NoSQL word doesn't mean much uh, because you can store any structure in your table. But uh, it's for your um, grasp of the problem, right? That's, it, it gives you a lot of power and comes with a lot of responsibility. You can see all the statistics here. Um, this is the part where, where Azure Portal is still working because I was trying to send uh, sensors and put it into the database for the last hour before I started the talk, and I still could see no data, no requests, zero. It is refreshing stuff when it wants to be and decides to be. So don't be alarmed if you're putting the data and you don't see it here. The same is actually with Event Hub. Uh, when I went to the dashboard and, yeah, I was sending the data, uh, yeah, like, like here, so it, so it grasped it. But if, if I was sending the data, it's, uh, it, it's my London time, by the way, that's why it's seven here, uh, at 7.10, you wouldn't see it for the next half an hour because this is the pace it refreshes stuff. Okay, we have Event Hub, we have our database. This is a cool thing you can, uh, actually I wanted to do this, you can uh, run a simple query if you want. So this is the way of checking if you have data in your database rather than the statistics and because they are not refreshed very well. And then you need to have something that processes it. So let's, let's look at the architecture again. So what our stream analytics is doing, it's taking our sensors data, it applies the average and standard deviation to it and then calls machine learning. There's a lot of going on in the small two, two arrows I wrote, <laughs> like three hour arrows. So we have a lot of stuff. And with the, uh, with the standard approach, I'll show you that. Uh, I, I took screenshot because I didn't believe in this Wi-Fi and kind of was right. In the standard approach, if we want to do average, from our sensor, this is what we would do, right? We want to see what's, what was the average for this kind of a device. Is this understandable for everyone? Cool. Uh, but in stream analytics, we only have pieces of data, right? So, so we want to, we need to, we need to think of something smarter. And actually, with this particular time frame, we only have this. So, we, what we need to tell the stream analytics to do is apply tumbling window. And then the time frame can be uh, widened. 
you can do smarter things, right? But if you don't, if you won't do it, it won't, uh, the, the query won't pass, the, the job won't start, so you won't do anything stupid, of course, but uh, you might not understand if, if this is like the first contact you have with processing streaming data. You can use your application time. So if you have some fields that, that is a date, the date time, you can use it. Then you need to timestamp your stream properly. So we need to have average and standard deviation, and then we need to join it to our sensors that are coming in, right? With joins, we have similar problem. This is how we would do join, right? We have our stream, and we have our aggregated data, and we want to join them by ID. Again, we have a time frame and only pieces of data. We need to apply something that is called date difference. So you're saying that the date difference between CNA, which is our stream and the aggregated data, can differ, differ only by a minute. And then stream analytics can adjust. So I will show you now uh, I will stop my, maybe now, because we will see. I will show you how our query, query look like. And it is blurry. Uh, I'll, I'll, if I stop it, it will just not stop for a couple of minutes. But I will walk you through. So you create something that is basically calling average and standard deviation. So you have one table with our statistics. You have another think that is just taking the data, taking the settings, taking the cycle, taking the sensors data. And this is the thing when we call machine learning. So you're taking our sensors, you're taking our average, our standard deviation stuff, and you're plugging it in and calling machine learning. I will show you that maybe in a slide. Maybe this will be much more visible. Uh, I will unhide it. See, this is our like first table. We, I called it aggregate. This is our table with prediction, and this is where we call the machine learning. And this is where we join it with aggregate. So at the end, we have all the settings cycle all the reads, all the average data, all the standard deviations, and then we have prediction. So we called machine learning and we have our prediction with that. What we need to do later is to put it all together and send it to document DB. I don't know if I can, yeah. I We have, uh, we have our uh, ID, we have all of our Scott labels, and, and uh, everything goes to document DB. It is a hard query, mostly because we have 21 sensors. So you have 21 averages, you have 21 standard deviation things, and then this is something that you take from the machine learning, which was called result before, if you Remember here, see, this prediction was called result, and you get only scored labels. What are scored labels? If you look inside of the machine learning, it's the uh, label if it will need the maintenance or will it not need the maintenance. One would be yes, zero would be no. So maybe we have like, 15 minutes, maybe I will show you my beautiful UI, finally. Uh, what I need to do is, I need to run my Visual Studio, because I didn't publish it on IIS. Um, and 
So what we, what we have is, we have our data in a database. I will try to generate now more. I will start my generation. This is another good example of, of uh, how UI works. This is actually something I downloaded again from Cortana, something that generates the data because I don't have actual like thousands of planes that will generate my engine rips in the backyard. Um, so it will put the data into Event Hub. Uh, our stream analytics job is still running, so it will process it. It will put it into the database. And now I will try to show you how, how it will work on the UI. Hopefully, yay. Yeah, we need, to, we need to wait for, I think, 10 seconds, yes. See, the green ones mean that it's working, doesn't need maintenance. The, the red ones means you need to look at this device and plan the maintenance in the next two weeks. If you want to do something interesting with this app, you can, but I will put the, uh, the, the most of the code is already on GitHub, but uh, it needs a few tweaks that I did the last minute, so I need to publish them and push them on the GitHub. Uh, so this is basically what your dashboard in a more useful form would look like. Uh, so those are like real-time data. I, of course, put my own pace because I'm doing silly polling so uh, I've put pace that every second it will just add the new read. If you have a different pace, if you have m more data, basically, you need to do it smarter. You need to, you need to use sockets, for example, right? Uh, and do some something more fancy. Okay, we went through the stuff. The interesting part you can do once you have your reads and you see your dashboard and you're saying, yeah, it says it's okay, but I know it, it, last time when, when it had those reads, it, it broke. So you, if you have someone that is monitoring constantly the output of your machine learning or, or any algorithm basically that is deciding and predicting, you need to uh, apply some kind of an auditing, and then you can try to update your training data. Because maybe in the phase of training, your algorithm didn't get all the information. So we, we think it works correctly because it tested it on a test data, but with the real, real life, we need to adjust, and we need to adjust our, our model. This is why retraining concept was introduced. Uh, and we're still talking about this offline updating. So we update our training data and we run our learning process again. We're not adding new data to our existing running model. So what else we, we need to do is to just, you know, trigger the learning phase. And in any uh, model that you, in any platform, there's probably like a button or you need to rerun your Python or R, R script so it has new data. With machine learning uh, in, on Azure, you can actually set up a web service to do it. So what you need to do, if this is, this is the simple experiment that fits in one half of the page. It, it's quite valid. It, it Mm, it predicts your, uh, it predicts your, uh, when, you, when you want to take a loan, uh, risk, if you will be risky for a bank. So it, it looks at the income and, and it can uh, make a decision if the bank should give you a loan or not. It actually, I, I heard it actually works, like on production system when, when you have an algorithm like this. So. If you have your algorithm, if you have your model, you of course need to um, train your experiment and then you need to have something that is called scoring experiment. 
So you need to have this in your experiment. What scoring does is it takes your data and applies those labels or numbers depending on what your experiment is doing. Is it a regression or is it a classification? So you need to have this bit. Another thing you need to do, you need to publish your web service in the classic way I just shown you. So you publish your predictive model and you have it and you can use it. And then you need to have something, you need to add it uh, manually and put it into the train model. Why? Because this will be the web service, this will be the API that you will be calling while retraining the model. So you need to create something additional to this, what you've just created, and apply it to your train model. So you create a web service and you connect uh, it, the output to, the, to your train model. And another thing you need to do is to add a new ad endpoint. If you go to machine learning studio and you go to, uh, and go to experiment and there is a, I don't know if you can see it, the web services tab. You have a list of web services. You just need to add a new endpoint. It's not done automatically as it is for normal publishing the endpoint. Because the default just gets your scoring model, gets your predictions. If you want to add the retraining, you need to do it manually. But it is simple, it's just the thing you need to do. So how do we do the retraining scenario? We'll go to my app. So my idea was um, someone comes in and just do a random checking, so clicks on uh, one of the devices and looks at the data, I, I shorten it, only five reads and only five average, oh, sorry, you didn't tell me. I'm in the presenter's mode, <laughs> so when I go, I'll just do it again. Someone goes to the app and decides, I will see about this read. Did I click on it? Yes, I did. Yeah, and I shortened the list only to five reads, to only to five averages and to five uh, standard deviation, but you get the point. And they look for the numbers and say, hmm, that's not wrong. This machine will break in two weeks. We can have it like human coming in, we can have it more automata automatized, and uh, we can have many ways, but the idea is someone says, this prediction is not good, right? And we need to change it. And we not, don't have to just change it like here, so someone can see this machine is breaking. We want our algorithm to know for the future that this reading is bad. So what we could do is we say, no, this is not good, this is actually red. And we can say, submit to our, uh, uh, submit to our uh, list of stuff that we change, we aud audit it. And then you can click retrain button, which would update your training data on the cloud and trigger retraining API and the retrain model will now do the proper thing. It could also take time depending on how quickly your, uh, your experiment is trained, right? So, so this is the basic idea. Yeah, I think we're just on time. I only have... Um, couple of slides left. We could have some questions, I think. The last thing I want to talk to you is about scaling web services, because we said Machine Learning Studio publishes web services, and as default, it goes from 20 to 200 uh, concurrent requests. So that nat natural question is, what if I want to do more? Then you need to go to the Azure portal and just treat this endpoint, treat this, those web services like any others. Try to randomly distribute it, just another web service. Nothing to do with machine learning per se, it's just how you would scale another endpoint. So this is it. We basically talked about mostly uh, different velocities of, of data, which is the main thing when you think of, uh, of machine learning. Uh, a little bit about machine learning and how it differs from, uh, from online learning 
and, and how the classic one look like, which is basically what you can do in Azure ML. We went through the, through the scenario of airplane maintenance predictions. And this is my architecture I wanted to share with you. Uh, this all will be available on GitHub, but I still have it locally, so uh, I probably will tweet about this. Then you can just take it, spin it up on Azure if you want, or just look how, how I would uh, configure it if, if you don't want to spend your Azure credits. I encourage you to go through the links of this presentation and go to this Cortana solution, which is much more complex and uses diff other different technologies. This is more for me to show you that you can easily plug in the stuff, but in a real life, for example, you could try to actually save those readings and then you need a um, data lake or even data warehouse, whatever, to store it because there can be thousands of millions of data, terabytes of data, and document DB wouldn't be a good choice. Uh, you can plug in different stuff you can uh, you want to do with stream analytics. Prediction, maintenance prediction is, is just one of them, but in a huge system, you can have other concerns and use the same, for example, in Event Hub to, to get the data in just. So we, if you have any questions, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm here until the end, so don't hesitate to, to talk to me. And thank you for coming again. Mm -hmm. Do I need to retrain the model for each of them and use separate uh, endpoints, or is there anything Azure ML can help me with swap, you know, swapping those models behind the scenes? Um, so <coughs> you probably need to retrain it anyway, even if you uh, download the ready-to-use solution, you need to retrain it, because the training phase is like on your account. It's done on your account. But um, you probably need to adjust the training data structure because this particular experiment or any experiment you take, takes a specific data structure. If your structure is different, then you need to retrain it. But you probably, very often, you just need to change this part, the data ingestion, because the rest of the, algor uh, of the experiment will adjust. It's just about the, you know, the input structure. Mm -hmm. just being interpreted in a different way. Okay. Right. So I may have a one airline that uses the same sensor, exactly the same, mm -hmm. giving me the same stream of data, mm -hmm. and they want to serve it every two weeks time, while the other one has a flag set true if the service is three weeks time. Do I need to create another uh, two separate models? Or I would create two separate uh, stream analytics jobs. Okay. But have just one model you, which you can query, right, in just different frequency. So it has a very serious limitation of how many customers you can serve. Um, Let's say it, it's feasible for two airlines, mm -hmm. but if I have 1,000 airlines, if it's even a K, mm -hmm. it would be kind of significant maintenance of all the same. Um, yes, but it would be with any API. It's just something that is served in the form of API. If, if you're calling an API, you still need to maintain it, right? If you have a lot of, a lot of traffic. There's no, no difference in, in, in this way. Um, there is no if statement in uh, in experiments in Azure ML so far, at least. Uh, so I think this, this would be a solution for, for your problem. But no, there, there isn't. Unless you write something in R. In R, you can have if statements or just pick up any algorithms. But there is no, um, no tools in those drag and drop stuff that you can control the flow.
Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. There is some model format, but it's not accessible. And I think this is something people really complain about. Uh, and I, I would think this, this is something people are working on, but I have no knowledge of it. Uh, but this is also something that bothers me. I would really, really like, or even upload a model like this, like our RAM template, and have it there, not store it some, somewhere there in the cloud, which yeah. it's a cloud, so <laughs> you know. So uh, at least for now. Of course, under the hood there is. It's just not publicly accessible for you. Thank you.